Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us on another episode of Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah and I'm here with my best friend and sister in Christ, Mireya. Hi. And we are going to be talking to Mireya's very favorite person. Yes. She loves this lady. <laughs> um, kind of a fangirl, right? Totally a fangirl, not kind of, totally. <laughs> <laughs> but we are excited because this is Mireya's first time on the podcast. And don't worry, you guys. Kevin is here. Morgan is here. They'll be editing this and making sure this is good before it's released. We have our headship <laughs> covering. <laughs> this is if anyone's freaking out right now. Covered. But um, we, our guest uh, is an author of a number one best-selling book in Christianity and religion called Stop Calling Me Beautiful. And she is also a blogger, a podcast host, and she's a mom and a wife. And so without further ado, it's my honor to welcome Felicia Masonheimer. Felicia, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, we're just so, so thankful that you're with us here today. And before we get into our conversation, we're going to give you kind of a loaded question, I guess. But we want you to share maybe about your upbringing and your testimony and what you now do today. Sure. So I grew up in northern Michigan. So basically Canada is the best way to <laughs> describe it as far north as you can go almost. And I grew up in a Christian home. My parents um, were very strong believers. They did their best to disciple us at home. So I had an advantage in the sense that I had parents who were very intentional in teaching us scripture and teaching us the gospel. And I did not grow up in an environment where um, things like hell were used to scare me into following Jesus. We had a very Jesus centric gospel where my parents really talked a lot about, um, just the beauty of walking with God and they lived that in front of me. And I think that was the bigger, bigger part of it was that they actually showed me what that walk looked like personally. Um, the one thing that's a little different about my upbringing was that the area in which I live, it's a highly Catholic area. I'm not Catholic. I'm I'm Protestant. And so we didn't have many church options where we where we live up here. Mm -hmm. And so we ha went through a church split when I was about 15. And after that, we visited quite a few different churches and, and were part of a home church for a period of time. I then went on to a Southern Baptist college and then attended several more denominations in my 20s. So because of that experience, I actually have um, been in or a member of or attended or visited so many different denominations. It has to be like 12 or 15 wow, at, wow. at this point. And the reason that that is unique is that it actually directly contributed to what I do today, mm -hmm. um, bridging between different denominations and helping Christians understand each other and understand their theology. So that's um, a blessing in disguise, even though at the time it, it wasn't always fun. Um, and so now um, after going to college for religion, I have a bachelor's degree in religion. I teach biblical literacy, theology, and understanding Christianity to Christians of all walks mm -hmm. and all ages. Awesome. And we also know that you are a national best-selling author to the book, Stop Calling Me Beautiful. And I just love the whole idea of it. And I want you to share more about it. But at our church, um, I lead the women's ministry with my mom. And we had a conference and I called it the Women's Awakening um, Conference. And to some people, it's confusing because they're like, awakening, that sounds like new agey and like <laughs> weird and spiritual. But my point of it was the verse, Ephesians 5.14, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, wake, O sleeper, arise from the dead and let Christ's light shine upon you. Mm -hmm. And so for that, the whole point of the conference was saying, women, we need to stop saying that, okay, there's nothing wrong with me. Like, I'm a princess. Like, you hear all the <laughs> things like daughter of the king. <laughs> all those are cute sayings, but... I was trying to let them know my favorite verse is 2 Timothy 2.22, to flee or run from anything that arouses, you know, youthful lusts and anything. And so for me growing up, I grew in a Christian home. You know, my dad's a pastor and I was very religious and pharisaical. And so I always hid everything because I need to be perfect, I thought. And I need everyone to know that, you know, I don't do anything wrong. And so when I started growing up, you know, we didn't you know, have cell phones. We knew we couldn't be alone with the opposite sex. Like all these reasons for, um, you know, our parents protecting us, which I was at the time, I hated it. But now I'm so thankful for it because during that time, 
there was like darkness in my life like even though I literally didn't have even the opportunity I guess to like look at pornography which a lot of people you know they do struggle with that it was other things for me like I'd literally just be working out and I would feel that feeling and then I would keep doing that which the word is a lot of people don't like calling it but masturbation and so for me it was like so embarrassing to admit that but it finally until I could just confess it like James 5, 16, confess your sins. I told that to my dad. I was so embarrassed. But then that's when the healing began. So for you, mm. that's why we look up to you because you were honest about, you know, you talked about it before I saw your podcast with Allie and how it was books that you would be reading that mm-hmm. were, you know, more sensual and stuff. And so can you just, what would advice that you would give to women who are maybe so filled with guilt and shame? And it's like the verse, Proverbs 28, 1, the the wicked flee when no one pursues them, the righteous are as bold as a lion. There's women that are so filled with like feeling offended and afraid. And I believe it's because they have sin that they don't know how to confess. So what is advice you give to women to confess or be open about that sin Mm. that they're maybe struggling with? Yeah. Yeah. You're right in that. I did, I did struggle in the same way. It sounds like as you, um, with, an addiction to erotica, which is just pornography in book form. So this was a little, it started before internet pornography was like super, super big. So I was pretty young. Um, and then of course linked that use of erotica with masturbation. At first I didn't know what it was. I had no idea, but I felt so much shame. I wasn't going to ask any questions. Um, which is your first, that's, that's the first lie the enemy always tells you. Like you can't bring it into the light because no one will accept you. No one will love you. They'll, they'll never forgive you all of these things. And by telling you that he just increases your shame. So you keep returning back to the same habit over and over and over again. It becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy. And so my advice would be to find someone that you feel safe enough to confess to. And I say safe enough because there will never be the perfect person mm-hmm. or the perfect time. Exactly. There will never, ever, it'll always be hard the first time <clears throat> you have that conversation. And I did have to ask several different people to hold me accountable mm-hmm. and to pray with mm-hmm. me because not all of them were capable or able to commit to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so each time I confessed, it became easier to have that conversation. Yep. Mm-hmm. And most of the women that I talked to said, I've struggled the same yeah. way or I, my, I know someone who has, and I can connect you with them. And so it was bringing it into the light actually broke the mm-hmm. hold of that shame. Yeah. I wasn't done with it overnight by any means. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's not always how it works exactly. for people. But, and I did still have to set up boundaries. Yeah. Like I didn't read fiction for a very long time. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't even go to the movie theater for years yeah. because I just couldn't guarantee mm-hmm what would be on the screen. And I was just too sensitive to it at the time. Mm -hmm. So I think you do have to be aware of your boundaries and aware of what's triggering for you. But at the same time, know that there is hope in the, the last thing I'd say is if you think that victory is a destination, Mm -hmm. like one day I'll get there and I'll never be tempted again. Mm -hmm. You'll always be discouraged. You'll be so discouraged. Mm -hmm. You'll do, I don't know if you did this, but like, where you're marking the calendar, yes. you know, for how long you are good <laughs> and and you get so depressed because you fail. Yeah. Instead of living that way, live in the way, and I believe it's in Hebrews where it says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that we have an advocate. Mm-hmm. We can go to Jesus and he stands in the gap for us. Mm-hmm. And that's for no, anything you've done. Exactly. So all you have to do is confess and repent and he will walk with you and forgive you and restore you. Mm-hmm. And if you fail again, you can do the same thing again. And the more you understand the grace you're under, the less you'll desire Amen. to fail Amen. again. That's good. And so that's a lot. And someone might be like, oh my gosh, I feel like that was a fire hose. How <laughs> do I even how do I even get that? But I would say just learning what repentance actually Amen. means and what grace is, is the key Amen. to really beginning the, to walk in freedom Amen. on that. I love that. I love that. And so we encourage everyone to, Go check out your book. Stop calling me beautiful because 
that would be a good resource as well. But Mireya, do you have your questions that you wanted to ask as well? I do. I just, well, first of all, I just want to thank you so much for your ministry. It's Amen. really been a blessing to me. And I know so many other young women, older women, any any walk of life, like I just really have been blessed by your ministry and your openness with your own yeah. struggles and just um, just the advocacy you, you place um, for biblical literacy and just loving the Lord sincerely mm. and not just obtaining head knowledge and being puffed up with pride, but yeah. sincerely being a, steward, a student of the word. And I love that. So thank Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, thank you. That's encouraging. Yeah, yeah. My, my question for you would actually be along those lines. Um, so the slogan for your website mm -hmm. and also the motto behind your ministry is every woman, woman, a theologian. So unfortunately, I know a lot of women might hear that and shrink back from that mm -hmm. statement uh, just because the term might the term theologian might um might cause them to think of some hyper intellectual person yeah. or even it might even have a masculine connotation to mm -hmm. it. And so my question for you would be, what does it mean for a woman to be a theologian? Mm, that's good. That is a great question because Yes, whenever we talk about this, I always say, I know you're probably picturing C.S. Lewis <laughs> in a library of leather bound books and like pipes yeah. and like really deep conversations. <laughs> but the reality is that the definition of theology is simply the study of the nature of God. Mm -hmm. So a systematic way of breaking down who God is in scripture. Mm -hmm. And if by that definition, every Christian exactly. should be a Amen. theologian, right? Mm -hmm. And also... We all actually have a theology already. Mm -hmm. We all think we all have assumptions about the nature of God. Even somebody who's new age or an atheist mm -hmm. has assumptions about God. Mm -hmm. An atheist might say, well, God is cruel and mm -hmm. I, I hate how he's presented in the Bible and mm -hmm. therefore he doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. You know, we, they have a theology. Mm -hmm. We also have a theology, but we might pick up our theology from having an abusive dad, mm. or maybe we pick up our theology from a horrible breakup that we had mm. with a guy who didn't love us, or maybe we have a theology formed by a legalistic church that we were mm. in. And so what we have to do is we have to break down that theology and compare it to scripture and see, does this actually line up with the heart of what the Bible teaches and what has been taught throughout church history? Mm. Or is this a false narrative? And that will be a lifelong journey. Um, but I think that the more people say, you know what, I'm going to own my faith, mm -hmm. especially women who will never go to seminary. Mm -hmm. Women can go to seminary, by the way, but mm -hmm. many women might say, I'm not going into ministry or I'm not going to seminary. Mm -hmm. Why do I need to do this? We need to do it because you're, you're talking to your coworkers, yeah. you're raising your kids, mm -hmm. you're, you're dating different guys. Mm -hmm. And you just have a life you're living personally with the Lord that if you don't understand who he is correctly, you can actually view him in a way that isn't true to who he mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. So we, by breaking down our theology and saying, okay, well, I've always viewed God as a judge mm -hmm. who just wants to send me to hell. Mm -hmm. Is that actually true? Is that what the Bible teaches? Or I've always viewed God... Um, as an unloving father, because that's all I've ever known. Mm. What does the Bible teach about God as father? And going through that process allows us to actually own our faith and feel more confident, mm. both in the Bible, but mostly in our relationship with God. Yeah, amen. That's good. That's good. Amen. That's yeah, so yeah. good. Um, I think to um, building off of that, a lot of women would say, <clears throat> well, I'm just not made that way. I'm not a studier. I'm not a academic. I, I'm just not made that way. All I know is that I love God and that's all I need to know. And so, I mean, there's, de there's definitely a hint of truth to that uh, statement because there is a simplicity to the gospel message. Amen. And um, we see that in Second Corinthians 2, 1 through 2. And Paul's speaking to the church of Corinth and he says, and I, when I came to you brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Mm -hmm. And then he also speaks of behaving with simplicity and not by earthly wisdom in his first letter to the church of Corinth. Mm -hmm. So I guess another question to you would be, um, how can we balance recognizing the simplicity of the gospel message while also taking seriously our roles as disciplined followers who are good stewards of the word of God and who are good stewards of studying mm -hmm. and finding ourselves as approved theologians? I love that you asked that question. So I want to actually, let's look at um, 
Hebrews 6, because the author of Hebrews kind of answers this question. I have like books teetering on my desk here, so if they go flying, <laughs> that's what you're hearing. <laughs> yeah, flying off my desk here. Okay. The reason we're going to look at Hebrews is because the author of Hebrews actually talked about this mm-hmm. and, and had a lot to say about the simplicity of the gospel, but then where do we go from there? Mm-hmm. And I'm actually going to start in Hebrews 5, 11. Okay. He says, About this we have much to say, but it is hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. Mm. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, Mm. you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. Mm. You need milk, not solid food. Mm. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Mm. So let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Mm. So what he's saying here is he's talking to a crowd of people who have been in the faith for a very long period of time, Mm. but they're not growing past the elementary doctrines. Mm. And he lists them out for us. He says, basically, repentance from sin and turning to salvation Mm. Instruction about washings, which is most likely baptism, Mm. laying on of hands, probably the Holy Mm. Spirit, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Mm. So he's saying these are the basics. We shouldn't have to go back there because at this point you should be able to grow beyond that by having your powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from Mm. evil. So to the woman who says like, well, I'm not a big studier, this is what I would gently say. I'm so glad you love the simplicity of the gospel and you have those foundational Mm -hmm. truths. That's so, so good. And you've got to have those, Mm -hmm. right? Yes. But at some point, the gospel has to intersect with your real Mm -hmm. life. It's going to intersect with the question in your community of, I mean, just look at the world right now. What what topic do we want to pick? (laughs) There's just so many. Mm -hmm. Um, But like just communicating with with a friend who you're having a difficulty with, how does the gospel interact with that? Maybe you're confronting a sin issue with a friend. Mm -hmm. Well, how do we know that it is a sin issue? Mm -hmm. How are you supposed to confront it? What do you do if she repents? What do you do if she doesn't? Mm -hmm. Those are detailed theological things that are in scripture. But if all you ever do is focus on those elementary Mm -hmm. doctrines, how are you going to know how to deal with that? Or maybe you're navigating your Facebook feed and you're seeing these teachings about Jesus. Jesus didn't wasn't really God, or he, you know, he he taught these things politically. How are you going to know whether that's yep. true mm-hmm. or not? Exactly. Through your study of theology. Mm-hmm. And so you do not have to go pick up a giant <laughs> textbook and start there. Um, it, you don't have to feel overwhelmed. There is a way to study theology without becoming C.S. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. I love that. Amen. I love that. I think I'm just going to record your answer and then play it for somebody, whoever <laughs> yeah, says exactly. that or asks that. Just, just don't want to <laughs> mess that up. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to what Felicia says. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, that was great. And I think um, in light of the last question, then this is just the following the logical train of thought. Um I am curious to know what your opinion is. What do you think, what does it look like for a woman who knows so much or um, who knows a lot to be humble and submissive, um, whether that's in the church or in the home under the headship of the father or um, under the headship of their husband? Um, What does that look like practically for somebody who does know a lot? And I know like um, you were just mentioning your upbringing. And for instance, you we're all similar in the sense that we all grew up in Christian homes. We had parents dedicated to the word of God and dedicated to training us up in the Mm -hmm. fear of the Lord. And I'm so thankful for that. So blessed for that upbringing. And then also all three of us went to uh, Christian universities and all three of us had Christian educations. And we and then I know I love studying just naturally. I do enjoy reading big books and things like Mm -hmm. that. So um, I definitely am blessed to have that upbringing like, you know, I'm sure you two are as well. Um, And so. Um, what would you say to girls like this? Um, how do we remain humble and submissive? How do we remain um, humble in the church and the home? What does that look like practically? 
That is a great question. So if someone's listening and they're triggered by the word submissive, <laughs> I would just I would just explain it this way. Um, the word, the actual word for submitting submission in scripture simply means to defer to mm-hmm. and in a way to honor that person okay. in love. And the same word is actually used, a very similar word is actually used by Peter towards husband saying, mm. and you should honor your wife mm. or your prayers will be hindered. Mm. So it's not that what we're talking about here is is not that someone is just unconditionally submitting to this unloving yeah. mm-hmm. man mm-hmm. who disrespects his wife. Mm-hmm. That's obviously not what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. But as a, you know, I think people have called me an, a strong woman. Mm-hmm. I think women <laughs> are, are strong in many different ways, yeah. not just those who teach, but, mm-hmm. Us too. <laughs> you know, the question is, what does that look like then in my marriage? I'm married t- to a quieter man, mm-hmm. a man who tends to be a servant in the background. He doesn't Mm. like the stage. Mm -hmm. And so for us, that submission looks like deferring to him when he would never demand that I defer Mm. to him. Mm. So how can I be sensitive to his needs, to the fact that he's not going to complain? How can I maybe stop my constant outward working Mm. or thinking of the next big ministry idea Mm -hmm. and remember that First ministry is the home. Mm-hmm. How how does that look between is my marriage being tended to? Mm. So in ministry, whether you're a woman or a man, the danger is to idolize your ministry mm-hmm. instead of keeping your priorities in place. Mm-hmm. And for me, my priorities are are the Lord, personal relationship with Him, mm-hmm. of course, and then my marriage, and then my kids, mm-hmm. and then my ministry and my business. Mm-hmm. And when I get those out of order, what actually happens is I begin to lack integrity mm. in my ministry, my business. Mm. How can I t- teach other people to disciple their kids mm. when my own kids are getting the back burner? Mm. That's that's an unhealthy place to be. Mm. As far as with the church, um, this is something I try to be very intentional about. Mm. Um, and in our current church, we I have talked with the leadership of that church and, and told them, I'm running this ministry. It's growing. It's exciting. But I am asking that I can come under the covering and authority of this church Mm, because I do believe that one of the other potential dangers with ministries is that we can become so disassociated and unattached to a local body Mm -hmm. that there's no accountability, there's no oversight, there's no theological oversight. And so it is very important to me to be in contact with, connected to, and under the accountability of a local church body. And and fortunately, this church has been wonderful about doing that for me. Praise God. We love that because I wanted to ask this question too, and I think it will fit here, is for us. So this is the first time Mireya has actually co-hosted with me. But (laughs) at first I was kind of like, oh, I don't know if we should do this because my dad's not here and my brother, Pastor Morgan, and... And I think it was, I was realizing it was for me more of a show, like to see like, oh, they, they're my headship and they're right there. <laughs> but right now, like example, we have Pastor Kevin who is listening. We have my brother who's going to, he's preparing a sermon for the Sunday. So he's not able to be here and join me this time, but he's going to watch it before we even release it. But we have a lot of people. So we're part of Calvary, but a lot of people are freaked out, you know, for women to speak at all, like, mm-hmm. or say anything which um, we're continuationists and we're also um, complementarianists. So for us, we believe, you know, women, we have, we're, we're equal, but we have different roles. But I think that freaks people out because they don't understand that. And so for you, what would you say for the people or maybe the people even listening to right now and saying, okay, sure, I know that Mariah has her dad. My dad's my pastor, my dad and my boss, which is kind of <laughs> different. But he's my headship, like he's my covering. And so my dad, he does let me, you know, we believe like women can prophesy. And I do that, but it's under the headship. So can you explain to people who don't understand why is that biblical and what does that look like, I guess? Well, I will say in discussing this that there's a variety of views on the topic, yeah, obviously. True. You have you have even within complementarianism you have a spectrum. Mm-hmm. So you have um you would have a what I think a lot of people demonize as the extreme, yeah, extreme yes. complementarianism, which is just patriarchy. Yeah, it's yeah. controlling, it's it's um disrespectful, it, it doesn't adhere to Ephesians five yeah. or any yeah. of that. 
And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have um, egalitarianism, which says men and women are equal, but they're also interchangeable in roles. Mm -hmm. So anything a man can do, a woman can do, et cetera. And usually somewhere in the middle fall, what a lot of people call a soft complementarian, which is most likely what I would be called, um, where I'm also continuationist. Women can pretty much serve in any capacity within the church as long as they're underneath the oversight of a male um, elder Amen. board Amen. or pastor. Yeah. And a lot of people would disagree with that and feel very uncomfortable with it. The The precedent for that is often looked through the lens of the Levitical priesthood mm -hmm. and the apostles and Jesus' disciples. Mm -hmm. We know for fact that there were women leading and serving within the yeah. church. We know that for mm -hmm. fact. And we know they were prophesying. We see it in Acts. We see it in Corinthians. It's actually the entire context of the discussions around head coverings mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that is that women were prophesying. Oh. So, you know, that's an important thing to acknowledge that, like, women were not silent. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so when Paul talks about being silent, it couldn't be both, mm -hmm. you know. So all that to say, when people are like, well, where does this come from? A lot of it goes back to Genesis. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at multiple passages and you're putting them all together to form a whole council of God conclusion mm -hmm. that this is this is a structure echoed in the church and in the home. And it's not meant to be oppressive. It's meant to be united. It's mm -hmm. meant to be complementary. But what I always joke, um, because Josh and I are are so different and our, our merit, we are always confused for egalitarians <laughs> because I say a healthy complementarian marriage and a healthy complementarian church is actually going to look really egalitarian yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. because nobody's competing for exactly. power. That's how it should Amen. work. That's good. I love that because for us, we kind of get accused of that too. <laughs> but I think that what my dad always says is like, at the end of the day, we do know like in the beginning, like how God created things. We're not trying to just go based off culture because people go to the other extreme and they just use verses to fit their narrative and the, what they want. We don't want to do that. But at the end of the day, my dad's like, hey, I'm doing this because like this is why I believe from God. Like I'm going to have to give an account, mm -hmm. right? He's going to, if he did let me speak and he was hearing from the Lord, no, this isn't right. He does need to also, I believe, even rebuke me or and say something and I have to be submissive and humble too. And I know, again, people hate that word, but I'm like, <laughs> I love that word because it's so freeing and it just feels like almost like a safe. protective, mm -hmm. yeah, like safe. And that's how I look at it. But you had a question kind of with that too, or after that. So. Um, yeah, I think, well, I think I, uh, <laughs> I was on the, opposite so kind of building off of the complementarianism and mm -hmm. the we mentioned charismatic or excuse me uh continuationist and cessationist yeah. view um i actually grew up um i was very very reformed and yeah. i was um i was a calvinist and um that that all changed a little bit ago but um I used to be the type of person, it's embarrassing to admit, but I used to be the type of person that would think, okay, um, reformed or Calvinist people, smart, charismatic, yeah. continuationist, not so smart. That's you know? why she came to church That's to what... disprove me. That's <laughs> no. what it was. Yeah, I just came here to prove her wrong. No, I'm totally kidding, but... <laughs> And our best I, friends. Yeah, <laughs> look what the Lord did. No, um, he's using me to convert her. No, I'm just kidding. I, I am a, a conti <laughs> continuationist. It's all but it's <laughs> I am a continuationist, but I used to be a cessationist um, just because I – it, and this was bad on my end. I, I was just, it was experiential, honestly, to me, yeah. experiential theology. I had gone to churches that misused the gifts yeah. and I was trigger shy and I was scared. And I didn't see in the Bible, I didn't see anything um, which said, you know, plainly the gifts have ceased. But I just took that view because I was scared of safe. the opposite end. Yeah. yeah, just to be safe, which is not a way to form your <laughs> doctrine at all. But um Thankful the Lord's grown me and taught me. But um, in line with that, so here's something that I used to say and what a lot of people would say. Mm -hmm. So we've got two things working against us. We're women and we're <laughs> continuationists. <laughs> so um, with that being said, we are emotionally driven, feelings-based experientialists mm -hmm. who don't actually uphold the sufficiency of scripture. Mm -hmm. But um, I think so. That's what I used to say about people yeah. who would like work. In, yeah, but like Mariah <laughs> and, and me now. And so um, that being said, how um, 
I think a lot of people would say that being a woman theologian is not compatible with these mm. views, being like mm. it, biblically um, hold, upholding the sufficiency of scripture and having these views are not compatible. And I used to think that. And so what would you say to old Mireya and <laughs> girls maybe who, who think well, that now? Yeah. <laughs> that is a tough one. So what when you're talking to someone who comes with that that angle and this is a lot of of what my job is it's an interdenominational relations is one yes. way i like to say it. <laughs> I <laughs> love of international that. relations i'm an interdenominational That's relations so good. um so with so when you know that someone has a high, places a high value on the sovereignty of scripture the sufficiency of scripture sovereignty of god mm-hmm. sufficiency of scripture um that's that's important to keep that at the forefront of the conversation yeah. Because what ha- what happens is uh, we start to get into a name calling. Mm. Um, let me demean you so I can make my argument win. Mm. And that, first of all, it's a logical fallacy. Mm. Secondly, it is a sin, yeah. and so we we can't do mm. that. So go into the conversation thinking, okay, this person really wants to preserve the sanctity of what Scripture mm. says, and I can respect mm. that. So lead the conversation with. I believe in the sufficiency of scripture Mm -hmm. because it's the sufficiency of scripture that convinced me to be a continuationist because it's the clearest reading of first Corinthians 13 and 14. When we understand what the perfect is, Mm -hmm. when it says, when the perfect has come, these things will be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. There's no indication in the text that says the perfect is the close of the Mm -hmm. new Testament canon or the apostolic era. The context says that it's Jesus himself. And so go to scripture when you're going to have that conversation Keep your tone loving. Mm. Don't expect to convince and don't go in Mm. trying to win. Mm. Just try to have the conversation. Say, you know, I respect that you love the word so much. Mm. I love the word so much too. Can I show you how I arrive at my conclusion Mm. here? As far as the feelings driven emotional thing, that comes from Victorian culture. It comes from Aristotle. It doesn't come from scripture. Mm. I don't know that that conversation is even worth delving mm-hmm. into because mm-hmm. if someone's buying into that, there are layers of, of um, problems. Mm-hmm. There's layers of cultural stuff being read into scripture mm-hmm. that's not there. Mm-hmm. And so I really believe that that's, that's something that can only be dealt with by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. That's good. I love that. Amen. Um, and then you have the one about tips and advice. Oh, yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, I think um, so. Obviously, one key element of being a theologian is biblical literacy, yeah. um, like we're just talking about. So, um, uh, let's talk about some hurdles to biblical literacy because mm-hmm. I think there are many that yeah. people will use. Um, but I think that the two biggest hurdles that I see continually brought up um, would be that the Bible is confusing and boring. Mm-hmm. I think those are two uh, main ones that I encounter a lot. So, what would you say to girls who think? to a girl who thinks she's either in- incapable of understanding the text or she just lacks the interest and motivation altogether. Okay. These two go hand in hand because we're motivated to do things we're interested mm-hmm. in. Yeah. So if we fix the boring part, mm-hmm. we usually fix the motivation mm-hmm. part yeah. too. Yeah. So the thing that I would not recommend to someone who's new to reading the Bible is one of those read through the Bible in a year <laughs> plans. Those kinds of things are just, they're just too much. They're too much for even me mm-hmm. sometimes. Like I started one this year and I've read through the Bible five times. And this year I was like, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just done this year. I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to do something else. So, you know, if that's happening to me, it's happening for sure Amen. to young believers. Mm-hmm. So I would say pick some, I mean, first John five mm-hmm. chapters. Don't set a time frame. Just take your time Mm -hmm. and then get some context. So there are so many resources out there. I'm sure your church has so many great resources to help them. But things like the Bible Project, which tells you who's writing Mm -hmm. and what the book is about Mm -hmm. and what happens in it. Little five-minute video on YouTube Mm -hmm. to help with context. Study Bibles that have the notes and the maps and and all of that in them, that can be so helpful for somebody who's starting out um, to kind of get the context. And then what I usually recommend to people is, look, it'd be great if you could do it every day. And I'm borrowing this from a Bible teacher named Jen Wilkin. But what she says is, if you can't do it a little bit every day, focus on getting two or three days a week of like 20 to 30 minutes. And that will at least give you enough exposure to be consistently learning more. Mm-hmm. 
And then I would add community. Mm. Surround yourself with other people who are studying the Bible, can help answer your questions, who will wrestle with you, who will direct you to resources. Mm. Studying in community doesn't have to be an official small group even. It can just be a friend who you meet up with. I think that really helps with not feeling alone or overwhelmed Mm -hmm. with the process. Um, so that, so that's a starting point. I think the more you like get little bits and pieces and see patterns and connections, the more exciting it is. And the more often you will return to it. I love that. And for me, what I noticed is cause I was doing that in a religious way. I was just like every year, read the one, your Bible, read the one, your Bible. <laughs> but then I started looking at more of a duty instead of delight mm-hmm. of just loving God and just mm-hmm. loving, you know, learning more about him and reading the word. And so it became just like a duty. So that's why I encourage people like what you said, just pick a book. Mireya told me that very thing because I was <laughs> like, I need help. And I, I'm like, I should know by now. But it was just, I was just kind of getting overwhelmed. I'm like, where, mm-hmm. like what people always say, where do I even begin? Mm-hmm. And so that's what she said. Just like pick a book and then just like start studying or reading. I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. So, and she's been my accountability partner too with that. So <laughs> like she's good. Well, that's so awesome. It's good to have her. Awesome. Like Did you have any last questions? For her? Um, no, I just, I love what you said. And I think like just the same thing, mm-hmm. like as long as um, scripture, like we're humans, we're designed to uh, consume what gives us pleasure. And if yeah. the word of God gives us pleasure, we learn to take pleasure in it and delight in it, then that it will be easy to yeah. you know not easy all the time because we're still yeah. falling but um it will definitely be more of a delight than a duty um and so yeah i mean we're almost done but i have just one more question uh for the girl who's watching and she says yes i love this i love what's being said i want to be well versed in scripture i want to know the lord more i want to know um, of his character and i want to be a theologian um where do i start what do you what do you tell us? yeah and with some resources can- Yeah. Okay. So if you were to go to my website, which is Mm FeliciaMasonheimer.com, not every woman a theologian, it says that on the website, (laughs) but it's not the actual URL, (laughs) FeliciaMasonheimer.com. I have a bunch of free resources Mm -hmm. on my resources page, free downloads, free theology basics, email course. You'll get an email a day with some Mm -hmm. basics right to your inbox. We have a free Bible study email course as Mm -hmm. well that comes to your inbox and just gives you tips for breaking down the text. Um, We find that email works well because you're always in your email at some Mm -hmm. point and you can just read really quick through it and then delete it or keep it, whatever you want. Um, we also have a bunch of ebooks that are five to ten dollars on different topics that you can print out or just read on your phone or on your iPad on all different topics, including an entire ebook of theology basics. So where do I start? How do I know what the basic Christian teachings are? That ebook was written just for that reason. That's good. That's awesome. So we have all of that. Um, I also have a podcast in its fourth season called Verity with Felicia Masonheimer. And Verity just means truth. Um, And so that is currently in a theology questions season. So we've covered um, the origins of Easter. We've covered some stuff on baptism. We've covered Calvinism, things like that. And then I also have the book, which you mentioned, Stop Calling Me Beautiful, and a blog that has 500 wow. posts. So there's a lot there if you want to dig around. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> well, we basically are finished, but do you have any closing thoughts? Or I maybe maybe make it a little personal. For those even maybe single women out there who are afraid to you know really study the word, I feel like I noticed this when I did CrossFit too. A lot of girls are like, I'm scared to work out because I'm scared that I'm going to get really buff, which I tell them like, you're not unless you're taking supplement stuff going to get more buff than that. Don't worry. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Um, but what would you say to those girls that I've struggled with this, Mireya too, where mm-hmm. – you think, oh, if we know too much, then like guys are going to be intimidated by us or, mm-hmm. you know, we have to have a man that can lead us, you know, spiritually, we think. or So mm-hmm. we get kind of disheartened and depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Some encouragement. If a guy, if a guy wants you to dumb down your yeah. walk with God in order to be with him, he's not the Amen. kind of guy you should Amen. be. Amen. That's good. Because <laughs> a man of God can handle a strong woman of faith and not just handle, he can respect her. And I say that as somebody who married a man who was a newer believer. We got, we, when we got married, I had a religion degree and an entire background of being discipled. Hmm. He didn't have that. Hmm. So I can testify that while you probably will have, you know, more knowledge than him, 
The point is just that he needs the desire, the desire to grow. And if he has that, you'll be equally yoked. Amen. They're out there. That's good. Amen. That's good. I love that. Well, Felicia, thanks so much for joining us. And again, we encourage everyone to go check out your website, FeliciaMasonheimer.com, right? And then yep. get your book, Stop Calling Me Beautiful, listen to your podcast, Verity, and your blog. And follow and her on that. Instagram. Follow her on Instagram. <laughs> we'll have all that in the description below. So everyone go check that out. But again, thanks for, for, so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me, ladies. Thank you so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you would like to listen to us wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. You can also follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. Thank you so much to our sponsor, Mission Heating and Cooling. And if you are in the Arizona area, please make sure to go to the description below and check out their website. Thanks so much, guys, and God bless. Amen.